many nepalese students don't know there are over um, 1500 university and they are providing the international standard educations in english mediums and there are several scholarships Uh, including the mix is scholarships it's a kind of solidarity that uh, once you go abroad you're known not by your name or surname it doesn't matter if you're tamang chhatri newar you're nepali and nepali becomes your identity higher education in japan begins after completing 6 years of elementary school 3 years of junior high school and 3 years of high total 12 12 years so international student wishing to enter japanese higher education must complete 12 years of education that is a must both the science and technology like how to make new solar uh, panels for example right through to how to deal with the real environmental problems which are human problems so you need to, you'll learn about law and economics uh, uh, the university in japan is uh, like a uh, prefixed but it's really well designed and then the and also there now the japanese good thing is japanese government is really encouraging receiving the more international students so that's why Uh, the um, Japanese government has uh, also providing a lot of the generous scholarships. Uh, this is the, the amount of money that the students received um, for, um, uh, yeah, like from 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 the government, and then you, you can also like receive vaccines. So it's basically it's very safe for international students um, to um, to study in Japan. Higher studies, the higher university level education opportunity, which is available in Japanese universities. This is not well known to many of the students. I think so because most of the students, what they feel is that the language is the basically main problem for them. Namaskar, konnichiwa, good afternoon. I am Jogdish Kharel. Tapai haru lai yo karyakram ma hardik swagat garna chahanchu. Mina sang o omkaya shuru koto o. Totemo Uresiku Omo Imas. I would like to heartily welcome you all. For the past 20 years, I have been working as a television journalist in Nepal through Image Channel Television. The contemporary issues like politics, education, health, and disaster management are matters of my priority and interest. with globalization education is not bound in a narrow circle now the time has changed we have reached a situation where we can easily pursue fundamentals to a higher level of education from different schools colleges and universities not just the ones in the country but worldwide with different alternatives In the context of Nepal studying abroad has become a major attraction for the Nepalese student as well from which Japan has become the second largest destination last time itself only more than yearly more than 10000 students were going to Japan to study Japan at present is becoming a good destination for the Nepali student What are the higher education opportunity for the Nepalese student in Japan? What kind of process should be followed by Nepalese student to study in Japan? How is the study environment in universities in Japan? How can scholarship and other facilities be available in Japan? Also, how many Nepalese student are competent to study abroad? we will be discussing these and much more on this subject in the virtual conference being organized today the nepal japan educational dialogue will be 2 hours long the keynote speaker of today's conference is mr t r dhakal recording in progress vice president of private and boarding school organization of nepal papson there are important panelists from various university of nepal and japan going to deliver their presentations today i would like to welcome mr victor sujatmiko international affairs office tokyo toyo university ms hiroko sasaki international admission officer rishu meikan university mr kiyoshi takida International Office Director Kyoto University of Advanced Science likewise Professor Jonathan Woodward 
the graduate school of arts and science the university of tokyo likewise assistant professor pavan bhatrai pulchok engineering campus tribon university he is the member of juan also miss rasi maharjan former nepali student ritsub meikan asia pacific university and from the organizer i would like to welcome mr kazu hero mori advisor international strategic group management planning department the university of tokyo likewise Ms. Masako Sano, Representative International Strategy Group Management Planning Department, the University of Tokyo. And last but not least, definitely Dr. Deepis Kharel, Researcher Lecturer, the University of Tokyo. And I would like to, along with this, I would like to welcome all. More than 500 participants are expected to be um, a participant uh, in this program. All the teachers, parents, students, and concerned stakeholders are participating in today's webinar. The first part of the program will be followed by the presentation on higher education opportunity for the Nepalese student in Japan and experience sharing by the panelists. And the second part of the program will be focused on Q&A session, sharing opinions, providing guidance to the interested student. All the students, all the participants, I would like to request you, you can put your questions regarding the program through the message inbox chart from the beginning of the program. You will, we will incorporate your questions in our question answer session along with mentioning your name. But if you are interested in asking your question yourself, you have to wait for the question and answer session. So this is the thing. Now, I would like to heartily welcome you all. I strongly believe that your active participation will make our program more meaningful and achievable. Now, I would like to request Dr. Dipesh Kharel, researcher and lecturer of the, the University of Tokyo to highlight about the program. Dr. Dipesh Kharel. First of all, on the behalf of study in Japan's global network project, the University of Tokyo, I'd like to welcome uh, respected vice uh, president, uh, all the panelists from Japan and Nepal, and so participant students, teachers, and parents uh, different part of Nepal. Uh, today's main uh, objectives, main op main aims of this uh, webinar is to fill the uh, information and, and knowledge gap between uh, Japanese uni university and the uh, Nepali academic institutions and students. Um, and the other aim is to provide the, the information to the prospective students about the higher education opportunity in Japan. In Japan, uh, currently there are over 320,000 um, international students from different parts of uh, the world. Uh, the, the first number of the uh, international students are Chinese and after that second uh, biggest group is the Vietnamese. And the third largest international, groups in, international students group in Japan are Nepalese. Uh, however, over the 80% Nepalese students are the language students and they still um, uh, the common perceptions of a uh, uh, study in Japan among the Nepalese students is the studying language and it still many Nepalese students don't know there are over um, 1500 university and they are providing the international standard education in English mediums and there are several scholarships. Uh, including the mixed scholarships and after uh, after the graduations uh, the students they have the chance to work in a different sector such as it service and the engineering and other sectors but those information is still lacking about the prospective students in nepal in nepal uh, the number of uh, um, graduated secondary um, schools, students is rapidly growing. Uh, those all are seeking for the tertiary educations, higher educations in abroad. And uh, 
Uh, today, uh, one of our the partners, Papson itself, have uh, more than six thousand schools, and then the more than four hundred thousand uh, students are uh, annually they are studying in uh, secondary ed ed educations. So many university, Japanese university, university may not know about this the uh, high source of the prospective potentials uh, international students in Nepal. So that's also the the reasons we like to organize this uh, the webinars to fill these information and knowledge gaps. Uh, today we have the uh, panelist, um, great panelist from the uh, uh, different university of Japan, and also uh, the panelist from the Nepal's, including the uh, our uh, former uh, students, graduate students from uh, Japan's. Uh, so also participant. Uh, from the different uh, schools uh, all over the Nepal's, and then uh, our uh, great keynote speakers, uh, vice president from the Papsons. So, from the today's presentations and uh, discussion and dialogue and sharing and exchange, I hope it will provide the great opportunity, of course, for the students for their higher education opportunity, but also helps to promote the collaboration and cooperations between the institutions uh, labels uh, in, in Japan and in Nepal. I also hope uh, these webinars help to improve uh, the relations between uh, Nepal and Japan in country labels, also in uh, citizens labels. I wish all the success of the webinars and thanks to all the participants and all the panelists. Uh, namaste. Thank you very much, Dr. Deepesh Karel, uh, uh, for your highlights uh, regarding the program. Uh, before we begin to the presentation, uh, once again, dear participant, I would like to uh, mention you that um, uh, you can put your questions regarding the program uh, through the message inbox chat from the beginning of the program we will incorporate your questions to our in our q and a sessions uh, so uh, you can start um, asking question or you can chat um, uh, expressing your view um, uh, uh, through the um, uh, inbox chat so, but if you are interested in asking question yourself, you have to wait for the question and answer session, which is uh, um, after the presentation. Uh, so, uh, the first presentation, I would like to request uh, uh, Ms. Rashi Maharjan, um, a former Nepali student, uh, Rishu Megan, uh, Asia Pacific University, your experience and uh, your achievement uh, for the higher education in Japan. Ms. Rashi Maharjan. I am Rashi Maharjan, and um, I did my bachelor's in international relations and peace studies. And here in Nepal, I did my schooling from Gyanodai Balbatika and my high school from St. Xavier's College. And I did my bachelor's from Ritsumeikon Asia Pacific University, shortly known as ABU. And I believe what is life without hobbies, right? So I love to read and my current read is Sapiens and I cannot wait to go back to my book after this webinar. So as all of you might know where ABU is, it is obviously located in Japan, but more specifically, it is located in the southernmost island of Japan called Kyushu in a city called Beppu located in Oita, which sounds like a second home to me right now. And Beppu is famous for hot springs. I believe it is the second in the world and first in Japan. And total population of Beppu is 121,000, including 600,000 APU students as of 2020. What I like most about APU is it's just like Nepal. It's just being close to home. It's away from big cities. And as you can see in the picture, it's close to the mountain and sea, just like Nepal. So there are two distinct colleges at APU. One is uh, Asia Pacific Studies, which gives you the Bachelor of Social Science, which is also 
um, something that I did. And another one is ABM, College of International Management, which gives you the Bachelor's of Business Administration. So the two distinct colleges have four different faculties. And the classes are both offered in English and Japanese. So if you feel that your Japanese is leveling up in the given years, you can also challenge yourself and take classes in Japanese, which is something that I did, which was very challenging, but definitely worth it as I look back. So statistically, there is 49.5% international students, 92 countries represented currently, and altogether 152 countries um, represented, represented by alumni and current students in total. And our graduates usually have um, job placement before graduating, and that stands at a strong 96.2%. Something that you might be interested and in, it's really important to take into consideration are the scholarship opportunities. And there are two schemes that APU provides. The first one is APU tuition reduction, which has five different schemes. So that means that once admitted, you get either from 30 to 100 or in middle scholarship. So that applies to your tuition. So if you get, so if your application and interview is spectacular, you're about to get 100% scholarship. That means you pay zero for tuition. And if you feel that your application was good, however, your interview was so-so, still you're getting scholarships. And that means that you're paying 30% of your tuition. And the primary difference in both of the schemes is that the tuition reduction is there for four years. That means throughout your education period, um, given that you do maintain your GPA, which is again, not difficult to do. And the second one is provided by private companies and organization, which you can apply after you enroll. So that happens every semester. So even if you don't get the semester, you can always try your best and apply next semester. Something that I have done countless times, which can be frustrating at times, but definitely is something that uh, you need to keep an eye on. So moving on to my experience or lessons learned throughout the years, I would like to say that, you know, people have this education um, mindset that um, we learn inside the classroom and everything we do is limited to lecture halls and colleges. But I truly believe that education for me is a tool that we use to solve the problems in our society. And people have this perception that once you go abroad, you don't do anything for Nepal. Everything channels outside, the money, the experience, the manpower. But for me, it was how do I use this platform that I have and how do I serve my country, Nepal? Because as much as we take pride in saying Buddha was born in Nepal, Mount Everest is here in Nepal, we know that the government, um, even though it is trying, we know that the problems are so deep-rooted that even in 10 years from now, we don't see the solution, right? Yesterday, I was walking in Darbar Mark and I saw maybe a 14 or 15-year-old teenager asking for money because he was very hungry. So we know that the problems are so deep-rooted. And if citizens like us abroad don't think about how to solve problems back home, I don't think anything is happening. And only the government is not doing anything. So we need to do things together. So this is an example of something that I did when I was in my fourth year. Um, this uh, on the left, you can see Building Nations Through Building Libraries. This is an initiative that I started um, in order to build a library in Tonahu. And there was a school called Sri Saraswati Madhimik Bidyale, and it looked uh, like this before, the storeroom over there. We wanted to build a library for the students over there, and we collected a crowdfunding. And with consistent, um, perseverant hard work and dedication, we were able to um, establish our library. And this is something that looks like this right now. We were able to collect books and um, funds from both Japan and Nepal um, with our generous APU friends and professors. And as I'm talking about my experience right now, it might seem that um, it, it's very easy or it's like a piece of cake, but I would say that um, if I look back, I would say that it's a roller coaster of emotions because um, you know you need to be resilient. You need to be um, falling countless number of times and you need to be standing up. You need to be failing and you need to keep on reminding yourself that you can do it. So that way you have to be resilient. You know, learning Japanese, adapting to a new environment is difficult, but if you're not resilient, um, it might not be as easy. So this is a quality you need to have. As you can see in my picture, this is my first year and I'm so dumbfolded by the questions asked to me in Japanese. The second quality that you need to have is challenging spirit. Um, I think that if you don't challenge yourself, if you don't push yourself beyond your boundaries, you don't learn anything new. 
right? The desire to strive for independence should be there in you if you want to travel abroad and if you want to gain those experiences. So this is a picture of me working part-time. Um, you know, there nobody tells you abroad how to manage your time. Nobody tells you this is the time you need to allocate for studying. This is the time you need to be working. You need to be independent. So that kind of management is, some, is something that you need to grow. And I, I think you will definitely um, learn throughout the years. Lastly, I think that uh, teamwork is very important because in this global era, we need to achieve to a common vision and we need to be doing it with all our um, people or team or how do I say, a group of people that um, envision something and you need to have that uh, support with you. And at the end of the day, you will also have friends from all across the globe. If you're interested about knowing more about Nepal students at APU, let me tell you that this student community over there is growing and we're also quite known for our academic excellence because Nepalese over there are very hardworking and uh, they're quite successful in landing scholarships because of their hardworking nature and um, you know I have done things that I never even did in Nepal uh, I've wear ethnic clothes that I didn't even wear in Nepal I've cooked food that I didn't even cook in Nepal so it's a kind of solidarity that uh, once you go abroad you're known not by your name or surname, it doesn't matter if you're Tamang, Chhatri, Newar, you're Nepali and Nepali becomes your identity. And um, your experiences are as broad as the hard work that you put in. So I would like to wish you all the best and thank you very much for listening. I'll be very happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Rossi. It's really interesting and uh, really, uh, I'm so excited um, uh, to hear you. And just one more question to you, Rossi. Uh, why did you select Japan for uh, your study destination in short? Would you please answer? I did not know about uh, Japan and Ritsumeikan okay. Asia Pacific University before. It was in my high school that my economics teacher did a presentation about Japan. And she told me one thing that stood out, which was, um, you know, in APU or in Japan, it's um, the environment is such that makes you a very hardworking person. Um, you go into the university, you see many people, they're equally working um, and equally talented. So, so you don't you remain where you are. are. You are always um, motivated to be like them. So that kind of motivation sparked uh, in me. And then I started to be interested and landed at APU in short, if I must say. Thank you so much uh, uh, for your presentation. Um, now I would like to move to Dr. Pavan Bhattrai, uh, Pulsuk Engineering Campus, Tribune University. He is the member of uh, uh, Juan also. Um, uh, dear sir, would you please uh, uh, focus your presentation on your experience, achievement and lesson learned uh, for the higher education opportunity in Japan? Dr. Pavan, now is your time. Thank you very much. Jagdish Kharel, uh, one of the golden voice of Nepalese television industry. Thank you very much, Deepesh Kharel, sir, for inviting me for such a good program. I'm very honored to be present in this program to give some information to the uh, aspiring students. Well, I think I have been informed that is they are undergraduates. So I, my all presentations, I would like to... Um, concentrate for the undergraduate course. Actually, pre previously I thought about the graduate one. No problem anyway. I am Pavan Bhatrai. I did my PhD from Kyoto University. And I also been to the United Nations University, Tokyo for my postgraduate. I did my master's from Norway, from Europe. And then I'm working currently in Truman University Institute of Engineering as a student professor of water resources. I've been a former general secretary and immediate vice president of Japanese University Alumni Association Nepal and currently the member of the Japanese University Alumni Association. Thank you very much. Now I want to start my presentation. Uh, basically, how do we know Japan? I, I have a very short clips for Japan. Number of student, uh, international students around 280,000. Japanese Nobel Prize winners around 27. Financial contribution to the United Nations is third country. Gross national income is the third country. Number of Japanese university in QS World University ranking 41. Number of industrial robots in operation in second in the world. So there are so many. You can global peace index in the ninth in the world. So you can see a lot of quick facts about the Japan. And what about the Nepalese student? So when you, are, you see this chart in the right hand side of my presentation, there already the piece has 
mentioned that we are the third largest country who is has a number in terms of number of students studying in Japan. But the problem is, uh, you will see the thirteen thousand out of nineteen thousand is two thousand sixteen data. Out of 19,000, 13,000 is in language school. It's a very pity. You already Dipesh mentioned that the perception of the Nepalese students here is the we have to go to Japan for the language school. Trouble while studying the language. I have to mention this one because many times I talk with my ambassador in Japanese ambassador in Nepal. He's always worried that all the Nepalese people are losing, losing a lot of money in language school and they have been have a dream that you will get a lot of jobs there uh, from the language school. But not for, for all it's true. But we are talking here about the university courses. So we have to think about the language school and the university courses. That was my first uh, uh, information to the new students. You have to understand about that one. And next one, what is the, how about the history of Nepalese students in Japan? You know, we are celebrating 120 years of Nepal-Japan uh, relationship uh, now, uh, this year, uh, with the help of Japanese embassy by Joan, because the, the first student we, the went, that went to Japan in 1902. So it's around 100, 120 years of history. So after the diplomatic uh, relation, we have started the mixed scholarship. First group of Nepalese students returned in 1905. You know about so many things, chestnut, Chrysanthemum, wisteria, these all things they brought to Nepal and you, we are uh, growing here and government of Japan is always emphasizing on education. So we are sold a lot of options to go to the Japan and we are celebrating 120 years of Nepal-Japan study relationship soon. Just want to highlight this picture. You have to know about this picture of the Japanese education system. It's a preschool, primary school, secondary school. But the major fact, what I am to, I want to emphasize to the new student that higher education in Japan begins after completing six years of elementary school, three years of junior high school, and three years of high total 12, 12 years. So international student wishing to enter Japanese higher education must complete 12 years of education. That is a must. So if you have not completed 12 years of education, you can take one or two year university preparatory course before entering the higher education. That is another information I want to share with the new students. And why study in Japan? I want to just uh, highlight the four major topics which I thought uh, I like. Uh, it's a fascinating and multifaceted culture system in the Japan. Diverse population used by all types of population in all over the Japan. Coexistence of multiple religions. There are so much religions living together. My one of my friends always say that in Japan, people are born as Shinto, get married to Christian, and died as a Buddhist. So it's all coexistence in the Japan. And we have a social convention. We boing, chopistic culture, boing to the elders and all, respect. So anybody we can say San or Sama. I, I humbly but I like this kind of culture, no tipping. If you go to the restaurant, you don't need to go to tip for the good service. They always provide the good service. So these are the very important cultural things I like during my stay in Japan. Another one is nature. You, from the mountains to coastline to river and lakes, heritage site, gorges, a lot of things you will find in Japan. A variety of the natural things and safety. One of the safest country in the world, I would say. Japan is the one of the safest country. Even you can walk, even my family go at the midnight 12. So nothing you have to worry about the Japan. And once in an interview with Jagdis, I always uh, mention this thing. I have lost my iPhone, which was very new, four times in the train and in a new place. And I got returned immediately from the police or anybody. That was not, I think, anybody, any country in the world, you will get such a things. It is only in Japan. I think. And food where it is a paradise, food paradise, I say in Japan, it's a food paradise. Still, I remember sushi, ramen, tempura, miso soup, tofu. All cities in Japan have especially the food and the restaurant is for food only. So these are a lot of paradise. So you don't, for, as a Nepalese, you don't have to worry about the food that it will not be mismatched to you. So these are the uh, why is a journal, I say, stay, uh, study in Japan about the university instruction? Maybe I'm biased to the engineering because I am a uh, technical person. So it's a world-class science and technology. You can learn about cutting-edge science, technology and medicines. 
So Japan, although it has a scarce resources, it becomes a leading country in manufacturing by its excellent education system. So education system is highly excellent. You can say instant noodle, we change the dietary life, karaoke, these all are from the Japanese. Digital camera, optical fibers, artificial art. You can lot to name and everywhere the Japanese stand the first. So you can study various subjects. Mechatronics, you can say disaster management, civil engineering. So except the engineering also, you got world-class education on any faculties. Japan is the best destination for these all the things. And research culture, you know the Nobel Prizes, this is a basic research they did, always from all. Dr. Pavan, please continue. Okay, okay. Thank you. So, another thing, uh, I've been to Europe and the people say, what is the difference between European and Japanese during the study? So, I write this language. When you have a very much problem in your study, Japanese professor always say, walk hard. And European professor say, take a break. So, it's a like of working culture is very nice what i think in japan so life from the student life and the if you so you have to be very good with the professors and professor is the whole system they they will guide you so you have to follow all the info all the command and all the things from the professors you have to have a very good relationship with the professors for for your future and for your career and education and uh, about the working culture, I used to say five plus two, five day do all the hard work and two day take a break. So five plus two is my way of doing work in the Japan. And the tuition fee and undergraduate, maybe you will get a lot of information from the university people and the university website. So there are the two two types of scholarship. One is the Mongbukagakusu makes a scholarship. This may be from embassy recommended. You will get from and Japanese embassy in Nepal, they are always open for this type of scholarship or university recommended to directly apply to the university. So each undergraduate student will be enrolled at a preparatory school designed by MIX for a one-year intensive course in Japanese language. And the preparatory course lasts for one year and grantee who has completed the preparatory education will go to the university designated by the MIX. Even you got the English speaking courses, you can directly apply and you can go there. And other scholarship, there's a private scholarship and university-wise specific scholarship. There is a Global 30 project, which is an English-based course project. You can got a lot of universities. You will directly select it. They have a selection criteria. We cannot explain now everything. You can um, surf the web and you will get all these scholarship about. And uh, certainly, I must uh, recommend you to follow these all the things and Japan is a very great destination for the study and your future of your knowledge. And I would like to stop my presentation from now and I'm happy to answer your query in the later stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pavan, uh, for your uh, presentation. Uh, now I would like to request uh, Professor Jonathan Woodward, the Graduate School of Arts and Science, the University of Tokyo. Uh, would you please focus your presentation on scholarship, academic program, study environment, and future career? Now, uh, Professor Jonathan, it's your time. So, um, it's very nice to, uh, nice to see you all here at this event today. So, I'm going to be uh, telling you a little bit about the University of Tokyo, and in particular, a program there called uh, PEAK. Um, so I myself, I'm originally from the United Kingdom. I, I studied chemistry at university and I got my undergraduate and PhD exams uh, doctorate from the University of Oxford in the UK. And I've been working at the University of Tokyo uh, for about 10 years. So my, why might you be interested in studying at the University of Tokyo itself? Um, well, the University of Tokyo is, is actually the oldest uh, national university in Japan. It was established originally in 1877 and in its modern form, uh, as we know it today, in 1947. We're quite a large university. We typically have around 30,000 students at any time and about 10,000 academic staff. You can see the current numbers here. And uh, we are ranked as one of the, uh, the top in universities in the world in the current uh, QS rankings. The University of Tokyo is ranked 24 in the world. 
Um, but perhaps what is particularly interesting is that um, when, when you take into account, if you look at the rankings that are adjusted for the cost of studying, you'll see that University of Tokyo is ranked third in the world because uh, it, it's actually considerably less expensive to study at the University of Tokyo than most of our international uh, competitors. Uh, and this is because the university is a Japanese national university and Japanese national universities have the same fees for all students, whether they're from Japan or whether they're international students and whether they're undergraduate students or whether they're graduate students. So the university has had 10 direct uh, Nobel Prize winners, you can see here, and there are actually 18 Nobel Prize winners associated with the university. And um, uh, as, you, as you heard before, the, the, the university is actually uh, very, very famous for its, uh, its pure research. And if you look through the famous Nature Journal index rankings for this year, across all academic institutions in the world and across all journals, you'll see that the University of Tokyo is ranked fourth in the world, even ahead of uh, Oxford and Cambridge in the United Kingdom. So what then is this program, this thing I'm talking about called PEAK? So PEAK stands for Programs in English at Komaba. So Komaba is the name of one of the main University of Tokyo campuses. The University of Tokyo has about five campuses in Tokyo, and there are two uh, main ones. One is, one is in a place called Hongo, and the other one is in Komaba. And in Komaba is where all undergraduate students spend their first two years. So it, regardless of whether they're Japanese students or international students, they all start here for two years. There are some pictures here of the Kamaba campus. And in the top right, you can see some of our students joining in a kind of uh, international lunch where, they, they, we make, where Japanese students and international students get together uh, every week for, for sharing, uh, sharing uh, together. And you'll see that the Kamaba campus is incredibly well located. It's actually in a very quiet, uh, natural environment next to a pond and, and but actually within, Within three or four minutes train ride or 15 minutes walk, you can be right in the center of Shibuya, which is the kind of heart of Tokyo nightlife. And you can see this is the famous Shibuya scramble here. So what is Peak then? Peak was launched uh, in 2012. And what it is, is the first opportunity for anyone to, from around the world to come and study at the University of Tokyo and get a bachelor's degree um, and to study entirely in English. So until 2012, if you wanted to come to the University of Tokyo, you would have to study in Japanese and you would have to take a very, very challenging Japanese entrance examination to, to, to have a chance of entering. But when PEAT launched, PEAT consists of two different programs. One is called the International Program on Environmental Sciences and the other is called the International Program on Japan and East Asia. And one really unique uh, feature of the courses, and, and, I, and I heard earlier, you know, there is a, a large number of Nepalese students are studying languages in Japan, but this maybe provides the kind of best of both worlds, because you do not need any Japanese knowledge to join PEAK, but you have to study Japanese as part of your undergraduate studies. So it's possible for you to study, get your bachelor's degree, for example, in environmental science, but at the same time, learn to speak and read and write Japanese uh, all in one go. So the University of Tokyo has a very particular philosophy of its education system. And that is that all, all students at the University of Tokyo study for uh, two years a liberal arts curriculum. That means they study a wide range of subjects from the arts through the humanities, the social sciences, the hard sciences and mathematics. Um, so you would take courses, selected courses from across the range uh, during your first two years. And then in the second two years, the years three and four, you specialize in one of two different uh, interdisciplinary subjects. So either environmental sciences, which is really uh, right at the, the cusp of, of kind of physical and life, life sciences and also social sciences. So we teach students to be environmental leaders and how to solve the environmental problems facing us. And that means learning 
both the science and technology, like how to make new solar uh, panels, for example, right through to how to deal with the real environmental problems, which are human problems. So you need to, you'll learn about law and economics, okay? And uh, you can see the topics here. And Japan in East Asia is on the other side. It's also an interdisciplinary program, but it sits between the humanities and the social sciences. And if you're interested in Japan and learning about Japan's uh, culture and history and, uh, and in, you know, its economics and politics, then Japan in East Asia looks at Japan within the context of East Asia and in the broader sense across the world. So those are the two programs that we offer. Now, I wanted to give you a good idea about what it actually costs to come and study at the university. So, as I mentioned, that we had there is a one-time admission fee which is about two thousand five hundred US dollars, and the annual tuition fee is about four thousand eight hundred US dollars per year. And all our students are offered accommodation at our brand new uh, Mejirodai International Village, and you get your private room there for, uh, and it, the the bills are about seven hundred fifty. US dollars per month, and that includes everything, including fast internet and all, all, your, all the things you need. And our students, when we survey them, say that this is the typical average amount that they spend on living in Tokyo and doing all the things that they want to do of about 725 US dollars per month. What's really important though, and I'm sure you wanna know about is the scholarship. And Peak have a really, really wonderful set of scholarship opportunities. So, when you apply to PEAK, you, you are automatically considered for a special scholarship. You don't have to do anything else. You don't have to apply for a scholarship. You just apply to the program. And every year, we're able to offer um, five dedicated uh, MEXT scholarships. So these are university recommendations. These are not uh, applied through the, the embassy. These are given to, you as direct, given to you directly through us. So these completely cover your entire education. So they include your airline ticket to and from Tokyo, your admission fee, your tuition fees, and a monthly allowance of about 1100 US dollars a month. We also have 10 very similar University of Tokyo scholarships, which give you all the same benefits, but just don't have the air airline ticket included, but you get the full cost of your education covered and your living costs while you're in, in Tokyo. And Peak, I should point out, is quite a small program, and we typically accept around 30 students per year, 15 onto the Environmental Sciences course, 15 onto the Japan and East Asia course. But what that means is that half of the successful applicants to Peak will get full scholarships. So if you're success awarded, accepted onto the program, there's a 50% chance that you're going to get a full scholarship to join the program. So I'll very briefly explain just how you can apply to the PEAK program, the, the, very roughly, so you need to check the documents in detail. But the basic application process for PEAK is in two stages. The first one is where you fill in our forms and send us some documents, which I'll explain in a moment. Then we do a document screening at the end of the year. And if you're, if you're selected, you will be invited to the second stage which is a personal online interview. And in the case of the environmental sciences program, also an online mathematics test. And based on your performance in these two stages, you'll be offered a place, uh, you may be offered a place in April uh, of the next year. So right now, if you want to join the university in September of next year, the application period starts uh, very soon in, a, in just over a week on November the 22nd and runs till December the 22nd. What do you need to do? Well, the whole process is conducted online. So you simply visit our website, create an account on our system and enter all your application details online. You fill in the form. We ask you to write an essay for us and your essay will be by read by professors and assessed. Um, we need your official school transcripts, a certificate saying you're gonna graduate from school um, and very importantly, we need some form of uh, standardized uh, examination results or national examination results. I'll say a little more in a moment. Um, if, you've, if you've studied at school all the time in English, uh, then you don't need to provide any tests for English proficiency. But if you studied in another language, you will, you will need to do that. And uh, finally, two uh, recommendation letters, basically from your teachers. So 
in order to apply, you do need to have the right kind of examinations. So we accept the, the, a wide range of standardized tests like the International Baccalaureate or A-Levels, International A-Levels, European Baccalaureate, Cambridge PU, SAT or ACT. And we also accept national tests from a, a wide range of countries. So you, what you need to do if you want to find out if you can apply is download our application guidelines. I'm sure we'll share the link in the chat. Um, and uh, then you need to check because we have minimum score requirements for all programs. You need to make sure that your, high, your scores are going to be higher than our minimum requirements. Then you can apply to the program. Okay, so I, I was trying to make sure I stayed on time. Uh, I haven't mentioned anything about careers. Do I have another one minute or two minutes to say something about careers? Yeah, sure, sure, please. So let me just say something about what our students do. So our graduate, our graduate student, oh, it's peak launched, as I said, in 2012. And our first graduates graduated four years later in 2016. And so here's a survey of, of most of our graduates who graduated from the program. And what you'll see is that about half of them go on to further studies, so to master's and PhD programs, and about half of them go directly to the workplace. And of those who stay for graduate school, um, quite a lot of them stay here in Japan. We have sister graduate school programs in the University of Tokyo, or students may go to other universities in Japan as well. Many of our students go to kind of prestigious schools in the US and the UK and also uh, other countries around the world. In terms of employment, quite some, remarkably, uh, actually almost 84% uh, of our students actually have gone on to get jobs and will enter the job market um, in Japan. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about what, they, what they've done afterwards. Um, so what I did want to show you is that, that the, these two programs that we offer are kind of unique in that they're very much interdisciplinary. And if you're at school and you're not sure what you want to do yet, if you just want to learn some more and find out what, what, what you might do as a career in the world, these are great programs because you, you have the opportunity to take courses on a huge range of different subjects. And what that means is as you start to specialize at the end, when you do your final year research project, it offers the opportunity to go into many, many different areas. So we have our students who've gone on to master's and PhD programs, as you can see in these very, very diverse range of different areas. So you're not limited by the programs at all. In fact, what they do is open many doors that you may not even be aware exist. And finally then, if you look at the same sto story is true when we look at employment, Many, as you might imagine, we're trying to grow leaders in our program and we're teaching uh, the international relations in the ES in the Japanese, Japan and East Asia program. And we're trying to build environmental managers and leaders. So we have quite a lot of our students go into this area of leadership in business and consulting and management for NGOs or government organizations and so on, and also into the financial sector. But you can also see the enormously broad range of different careers that students take when they finish. Okay, so I will finish there and uh, thank you very much for your, for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have in the Q&A later. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Jonathan Odwar, for your fruitful presentation. Now I would like to request uh, Mr. Kiyoshi Takeda, International Office Director, Kyoto University of Advanced Science. Um, dear sir, I would like to request you to focus your presentation on higher education opportunity um, uh, in Kyoto University of Advanced Science. Namaste, everyone. I'm Meru Namu uh, Takeda. I work at the Kyoto University of Advanced Science as an international office director. I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, be here today because uh, I'd like to introduce an uh, old English and you know, old exciting you know, engineering program for those interested in you know, coming to Japan to complete the engineering programs and become uh, full-fledged engineers to work for Japanese companies. Let me start, share, start sharing a screen with you so that I can start my presentation about our university. I am here today to introduce our uh, all English engineering program, which means that our program is entirely conducted in the English language, not in the Japanese language. The uh, good news is that when you apply for our program, if you don't have, have any prior knowledge of the Japanese language, at least when you apply for our program. 
So while I is studying engineering in Japan, uh, simply put, a uh, oh, world-class, first-class Japanese technology firms um, always on the lookout for well-educated engineers well, with great skills and with English skills. As you see here, um, by 2030 in Japan, believe it or not, um, there will be 790,000 too few engineers in Japan. In, in other words, in the, Japanese companies are basically are always look, look out for well-educated engineer, like I said, and all the time. And this is the reason, and now is the best time to think about Japan for your study destination. And actually, you can choose Japan as you and the, uh, as in the study destination where you you can complete your engineering program like ours to become a full-fledged engineer to work for Japanese companies. And in fact, uh, even among the developed Asian countries, uh, salary wise, the engineers in Japan are well paid the most, paid the most, as you see here. Uh, Japan annual average salary on uh, average salary for well educated, uh, skilled engineers, uh, is, it, it will, will, uh, will come up, right, uh, come up with something like $40,000 per year. On average, of course, the more more experience you have, then you'll be paid more. Than the less, and on the other hand, the less experience and less paid on the average. So we are located in one of the beautiful cities in the world, Kyoto, K Y O T O. Our but um, we are not uh, only the town of the tradition of culture. Uh, we are also uh, are considered to be a part of a young uh, town for young people, like you see here. If, if you come to Kyoto, there is a huge museum that specifically are exhibit these beautiful comic books, and then you might want to read these beautiful comic books on, on uh, over the weekend as a student. And let me talk about our university, Kyoto University of Advanced Science, KUAS for short. It started in 1969. It's a Japanese government accredited private university. It's located in Kyoto Prefecture with a, a great access to uh, two major cities in, uh, like Osaka, Tokyo, that has an international airport from Kathmandu and uh, uh, for flights from Kathmandu. And located in Kyoto Prefecture, it has 3,600 students. It offers programs of five faculties, including our brand new faculty of engineering. So we are so, we are so I am so proud to share with you this great news that um, just from just uh, from just last month we are started to sit, are hosting six Nepalese students on our in undergraduate program. And also, um, uh, in addition to our Nepalese students, we are also st host start, we are starting to host three Indian students. And then uh, out of three, out of these three Indian students, there are two female students. And uh, here's, a, here's, a, here's a Nepalese student and, who just enrolled on a program last month and then Bino Kondel and he's uh, standing uh, proudly standing at the, our uh, the front gate of our universities uh, pointing out our uh, logo of our universities and uh, we all like these pictures um, so what you learn um, uh, on our program is all these certain engineering fields from automation, computer, and electrical, electronic, and energy, energy engineering, drawing. There are so many uh, fields that you can have opportunity to learn about. And to make it uh, more, uh, you, to make the most, to make it sound simpler, um, you can choose. Actually, you can have a, a great range of flexibility to. Uh, choose what to learn from these certain fields. In other words, you can tailor your coursework in order to address your future career needs as an engineer. Very flexible. That's why we named this program as a multidisciplinary engineering program, centering around robotics, mechatronics. So um, 
I, as a, I'd imagine that when I graduate from our programs, I can, um, will be interested in the, uh, creating heavy industrial machines and also electric cars. Obviously, uh, there has been a major majority of people who are switching to uh, driving electric cars instead of gasoline car over uh, or environment, increased environmental awareness. Also, our graduates are, should be proficient at creating robots that are controlled by artificial intelligence in order to make people's lives a lot easier than now. Or simply, our graduates wanted to become more sophisticated uh, software program uh, developers, uh, 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 as you see at the bottom. The culmination of our program is the capstone project, where you are actually are are visited in the professional engineers' offices and to learn about the, uh, all of our issues that they face in the industry. And as a student, you are you know, supposed to learn about it and come up with your own solution and provide your own solution to the professional engineers. And this is going to be our stretching over two years, not just two days, not just two weeks, over two weeks, over two years. You know, in that con in that sense, you'd be uh, expected to uh, develop uh, well-educated uh, practical knowledge. And a tuition fee is of $14,000 per year. And, and it, very affordable and also our, we have a very strong uh, our, uh, scholarship program also from 13% tuition reduction through a 50% tuition waiver, even 100% tuition waiver uh, available if you are considered to be a top performing student. And application to opening date in December 1st or February 15th. Let me, you know, once, let me repeat once again. Our, our regular application entry will start on December 1st, just one month away. And also our, the other application entry window is going to start on February 15th. Uh, so these are application documents for Nepalese students. And even if you are not have have not taken or you have not obtained a, um, 10 plus 2 exam results, you can still apply for KUS as long as you are promised to send your final 10 plus 2 ex and exam scores in the next year. year. And uh, given the nature of our programs, uh, you'll be required to have a good comprehensive understanding of physics and math equivalent to the 10 plus 2 levels. And uh, you might be required to send us your English proficiency test scores as well. And so for further contact details, uh, for your convenience, I am so proud to introduce our um, Nepalese uh, official KUS representative, IZC. And they will give you a free, they will give you free consultation advice about you know, how to apply in the KUS engineering program. Uh, if you want to take a snapshot uh, here, I'll pause here. Okay, I uh, thank you very much for your, your kind attention. Um, I'll let the floor open to your question later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Kiyoshi uh, Takeda, International um, uh, Office uh, Director, Kyoto University of Advanced Science. Now, I would like to request uh, uh, Ms. Hiroko Sasaki, International Admissions Officer, Ritsu Meiken University. Uh, dear Madam, I would like to request you to focus your presentation on higher education opportunity in uh, Ritsu Meiken University. Namaste. Yeah, thank you very much. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm Hiroko Sasaki from Ritsu Meiken University. 
Actually, last year, uh, they explained about our sister university, APU. Their Sumeka is a sister university. Yes. So I'm so excited to deliver a brief introduction about our university to you because uh, I visited the Kathmandu and the Pokhala the 22 years ago. And then also that I studied the Nepalese student together at my institute later on. So today I will talk about our five English medium programs and then how to apply. Ritsumeka University is a long established comprehensive private research university. Our campus are in Kyoto, Osaka, and Shiga. Nearest airport is Kansai International Airport. We offer a wide range of academic disciplines. The university was selected for the top global university project, highly competitive government initiative in Japan. Currently, there are over 2,700 students from 71 countries, so one of the largest in Japan. Since we launched our first English medium degree program in 2011, the university has become more accessible to students from all over the world, and year by year, we are seeing more diversity. What can st uh, students study at Ritsumeka University? Currently, we offer five programs entirely in English. Our remarkable feature is that we offer collaborative degree programs with leading universities in Australia and the USA. Please be reminded that the enrollment period may differ from program to program. Also, each program are based at different campuses. So let me introduce each program briefly. The first one is dual degree program with the Australian National University at the College of Global Liberal Arts, GLA. Awarded degree are Bachelor of Global Liberal Arts from Ritsumeka University and Bachelor of Asia Pacific Affairs from ANU. The combination of a liberal arts education and Asia Pacific studies develop students to think critically, flexibility, and creatively across various disciplines and also deepen their understanding Asia Pacific affairs. Another unique collaborative degree program is the American University, Ritsumeka University joint degree program in College of International Relations, so-called JDP. Awarded degree is BA in Global International Relations, Students study two years in Ritsumeka in Kyoto and two years in American University in Washington, DC and explore international relations from multiple uh, perspectives from the Western point of view and the Asian point of view. We only offer air, April enrollment. Let's move on to our three single degree programs. The first one is the Global Studies major in the College of International Relations, GS. GS students earn a Bachelor of Arts in International Relations after four years of full-time study in Kyoto. We offer April and a September enrollment. The second single degree is the Community and Regional Policy Studies major at College of Policy Science, CRPS. Awarded degree is Bachelor of Art in Policy Science. This program educates students in policy design and implementation skills and encourages to take problem solving approaches while taking fieldwork projects and studying research methods intensively. The last one, single, uh, last one is the Information System Science and Engineering course at the College of Information Science and Engineering. It is one of the largest information college in Japan. Awarded degree is Bachelor of Engineering. The education and research covers a wide range of topics. Students in ISSC course are able to study further through project-based learning classes from the first year. Please take note that ISSC only offers April enrollment. After graduation, here is a list of some career paths among our students in English medium programs. 
some study to work, Amazon, IBM Japan, Honda, and so on in Japan, and also the, uh, around the world, and go back to the country. And also the others proceeded to uh, prestigious graduate schools in the world, such as University of Oxford, Columbia University, and so on. So this is a list of admission and tuition fee for our programs. It costs roughly from 11,000 US dollars to 22,000 US dollars annually, depending on the program. We do offer a very special scholarship only for international students. International students at Ritzmaker University are awarded at least a 20% tuition reduction with 50% or even 100% offered to, uh, to the most outstanding applicants. So, admission key features. Application is completed fully online and nothing has to be sent by post at the time of application. No Japanese proficiency is required for admissions. About the screening process, first, document screening. Listed here are some of the main documents we look at. After the document screening, applicants may or may not be called for an interview. Interviews are conducted online. Please bear in mind that this is a brief overview. So please check out the application handbook for details. Application timeline. We have multiple application periods depending on the program. For 2022 admissions, there are two more periods scheduled for September intakes. I hope now at least you know our five English medium programs. If you would like to know more, please join our coming webinars. Tomorrow we'll explain our programs in more details. If you are grade 12 and how um, to, know, uh, to uh, know more about how to apply, please join the next week webinar. And if you would like to know more about the student life, please join the webinar on 11th December. Find out more from our student. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. If you want to receive newsletters, please sign up through the QR code below. And all the information is available in our webpage. If you have any questions or concerns, feel free to reach out anytime. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Hiroko Sasaki, uh, International Admission Officer, uh, Rishumakan University, uh, for your fruitful presentation. Now we have uh, the last presenter, last panelist uh, uh, for this uh, webinar, Mr. Victor uh, Sujatmiko, uh, International Affairs Office, Toyo University. Uh, Mr. Victor, I would like to request you to focus uh, on your presentation and especially uh, focusing higher education opportunity uh, in your university. Now it's your time, time, Mr. Victor. Yeah, so like be benefits um, studying in Japan, um, I will explain about um, four things. Um, safety and um, quality of education, affordability and career. Um, yeah, I, 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 uh, I'm pretty sure like, you know, you, um, you listened about this um, in, in the previous presentations, but um, I'm going to make it like really brief. So like the first um, safety, um, again, like, you know, um, Japan, Tokyo is like really safe. Um, we, according to like, you know, several um, research um, results, um, Tokyo is just above Singapore. Uh, we are of uh, one of the um, safest uh, cities um, in, in the world. And even um, after, um, during the COVID, uh, as you can see here, uh, you can see um, Japan's always um, listed uh, on the top of the list, uh, according to like several um, research papers. And then um, what, what, what are these supports for international students then? Um, if you if you're studying in Japan, like regardless of the city, um, even if you're in Kyushu, um, like um, you know the Nepalese student who studied in in Epu or Ritsumeikan in Kyoto or even in Tokyo in Tokyo University, you'll be receiving what um, 
yeah, like, uh, this is the, the amount of money that the students received um, for, um, uh, yeah, like from, from, from the government. And then you, you can also like receive vaccines. So it's basically, it's very safe for international students um, to, um, to study in Japan. And then um, second one, um, of course, like if you want to study in a new country, especially in, in, yeah, in, in Japan, in this case, um, you have to see like the quality of education. And then, um, yeah, again, um, there are many Japanese universities in general. Um, many, um, all of them, they're, um, they're listed on the QS, um, TSU World University ranking. And then um, there is a research about um, about the um, doctoral enrollments um, in Japan um, in general is like really out there. So it means that um, in Japan, um, in the, the universities, um, they are taking their studies, um, you know, like, uh, they develop their, their studies from undergraduate graduate school to um, doctoral degree. So um, most like the Japanese like really um, passionate about studying. So it's it's a good thing um, if you're coming to Japan and then study in, in the Japanese universities, and then uh, you can enhance your um, your research and and um, yeah bring it to the next level. And then the third thing um, that you know um, if when you when you consider studying in Japan is about the affordability. Um, again, like you know, Japan, like especially Tokyo, it's not cheap. Um, you know, like you know, Paris, London, Tokyo, um, we're always crowned as um, you know, the most expensive cities in the world. And then, according um, to um, a data by JASO, it's an um, organization that um, supports international students, um, you, it, it requires to have about 85,000 um, Nepalese rupees per month in order to live in, in Japan. But um, I know it's expensive, but, but again, like, you know, um, there are many ways um, to, to finance your, your study in, in Japan in general. So, for example, um, scholarships, um, the many like universities, um, also to university also provide scholarships as well. And then also like, you can do like your part time job um, during your study um, in, in Japan. And then um, the, fourth, the, the fourth one is um, career. Um, why I mentioned about Korea is just because uh, when you go to university and then you graduate, um, there are only like two options. Either you go to graduate school, to master's, PhD, or uh, you work. And then if you come to Japan and then if you stay, remain um, in, in this country, uh, you're very welcome to stay to remain. And then um, the data here showed that um, the number of foreign workers in Japan, um, the number is increasing. So um, you, you can stay, you can remain, you can work in any, um, in any fields that you, that you wish. And then um, just give you a clearer picture about um, how much money that you can make. Um, it's approximately 200,000 in college should be per month. Again, like you know, this is fresh graduate, and then it depends um, on the company, depends on your skills, um, and then um, your, your background, and then um, the companies as well. So, um, yeah, I, I mentioned about um, four, uh, four things, um, you know, the, the, the benefits studying in Japan in general. Uh, I'm sorry, because I thought like, you know, I, I was going to be the, the first presenter. So it's, it's just, you know, give it a, a better picture about studying in Japan. Now I'm going to briefly talk about the university um, I'm representing. It's Toyo University. Um, we are one of the um, well-known uh, private universities in, in Japan, and we are one of the top global universities. Uh, that means that we are trusted uh, by the government um, to deliver um, um, university courses in English to internationalize the university. Um, I'm sorry, I, I didn't really um, uh, prepare many uh, presentations about um, our uh, university, but I'm just going to keep it like really brief. Um, our university is located in Tokyo. It's in the middle, um, it's in, literally in the middle of Tokyo. Tokyo um, is, is a very amazing city. Um, everything is happening in Tokyo. It's very exciting. Olympics um, is happening in Tokyo. It's very, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's full of, um, you know, traditions and then um, high, high rise buildings as well. If you come to Tokyo, you can feel the excitement um, because um, everything, you know, every single day is, is full of new things. And then um, all of our campuses um, are located in Tokyo. And then our main campus in Haksan, Haksan area, it's literally in the middle of Tokyo. 
Um, so it's really easy um, to to get um, to everywhere um, in, in 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 Tokyo. So for example, if you're looking for a part time job, or even if you want to look for uh, um, uh, you know, like a, a proper job after after graduate, it's, it's a very easy access because all the information is located in Tokyo. And then um, I'm going to talk about the faculties and departments that we have at Toyo University. Um, we basically have um, it, it's it's um, it's uh, we call it like Sogo Sogo University. So we we have a um, wide range of faculties from economics, business administration, science, engineering, engineering, and so forth. But unfortunately, um, these programs are conducted in Japanese. So if you want to study in one of these programs in our university, uh, you have to study Japanese first. Either you study Japanese um, in Japanese language in Nepal or in Tokyo and then come to our university. But because we're trying to answer um, the um, demands of international students um, recently uh, to study um, programs in English, we, uh, we, we, we design it. We design um, three programs, um, English track programs. Um, this is um, quite new. So uh, we have um, Department of Global Innovation Studies, Def um, Department of Information Networking, okay. and Department of Regional Development Studies. So we have three um, English rights programs. So um, to, to make it easier, um, I, I, I write down um, below the, the name of the department. So if you want to go into business and economics, if you want to um, well, you know, make more money, um, you go to the Department of Global Innovation Studies because you're going to innovate something new. And then if you want to get involved um, in the IT industries, uh, big data analysis, or working um, in IT, IT companies, then Department of Information and Working for Innovation and Design is the place for you. And then the third one is Department of Regional Development Studies. Um, basically, if you want um, to get involved in the sustainable development goals, or if you want to save the world, or if you want to contribute back to um, society back in Nepal, um, this is the um, department for you. So we have three departments, all in Charlie in English. Um, yeah, Department of Global Innovation Studies, Information Networking, Regional Development Studies. But unfortunately, again, I'm very really sorry. Um, we, we do not accept international students um, for um, next year uh, due to the COVID and then also like the scholarship scheme that we're still working on. Um, we used um, to have um, top global universe, um, top global scholarships um, that cover all the um, tuition fee plus one thousand five hundred US dollars per month. But because um, the COVID, so like we decided to uh, postpone the scholarship, and then we're going to bring it back again um, two years from now. So it's going to be in two thousand twenty-three September. Um, yeah, so um, stay tuned. If you are interested um, in, in into a university, um, please um, yeah, go to um, our website or Facebook page here. And then, um, or if you have any questions, please feel free to um, send email um, to us and then we're going to reply um, to you. So um, thank you so much. Um, I know like it's a very prompt. I'm trying to make it as, as, as brief as I can. Um, yeah, I really do hope that um, it's some um, beneficial uh, information that you know you got from this uh, presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Victor Sujat Miko, International Affairs Office at Toyo University for your uh, presentation. And uh, with this, I would like to uh, thank all the uh, panelist presentation for your wonderful presentation indeed as really being eye opener um, and fruitful for all those participants especially uh, for the uh, student um, uh, focusing on higher education opportunities in japan and especially mostly focusing on a scholarship academic program study environment and um, uh, relating to future career uh, as well um, uh, I am extremely delighted to uh, mention you that the participant uh, today in this webinar is from all part of Nepal. We have seven provinces in Nepal and all the participants are from seven provinces. So from east to west and north to south. So I am really excited and happy and thankful to all the participants uh, and of course uh, the panelist presenter um, uh, now um, uh, i would like to request uh, uh, 
uh, uh, Mr. Uh, T. R. Dhakal for the um, uh, keynote speech. He is the vice president of uh, private and boarding school organization of Nepal. It's called Papson. Papson is one of the leading organization uh, for the uh, quality education in Nepal. So, uh, Mr. T. R. Dhakal is very well known and pioneer figure. So, now may I request you, um, uh, Mr. T. R. Dhakal, for the uh, keynote speech. It is a very great privilege for me uh, to attend this webinar, which is organized by uh, Media Helpline, Papson, and then University uh, Higher Education Opportunities in Japan, Nepal Japan Education Dialogue, different groups. So it was a very wonderful presentation and the program was uh, panelist has given different types of different aspects of the things. Uh, I'm very much thankful to Kajuo Hiro San, Masako San, Hiriko San, Jonathan Woodward, Kiyosa Tadeka, and the presenter, particularly Dr. Pawan, Professor Dr. Pawan Batrai, sir, and likewise Rashi Marjan, and the panelists who have given the different aspects or opportunities in Japanese universities in the higher studies. Uh, it is a good privilege for private and boarding school organization Nepal to attend and to be a part of these type of programs, particularly Nepal and Japan, both being Asian countries, rich in cultural, natural, historical heritage, and having friendly bond relationship from last 120 years. Uh, Japan is a good friend of Nepal from the past time, and it is a good partner of Nepalese development also in various sectors. So from last few decades, Nepal tourism industry, particularly Japanese friends, each year, the number of Japanese people, they visit Nepal and having a very harmonious relationship with Nepalese people is a very good thing. So when we talk about Japan in Nepal, we find the people softness, harmonious environment, a good friendly relation with all the world and the hard working people in the world. Likewise, the Nepalese people also believe in the hard work. So the development they have made in the last few decades is a very, uh, what we call is a example for Nepalese people also. So when we talk about the development, Development is not a, only the physical infrastructure, but the human resource reach in knowledge and skills, which they are constantly producing in Japanese education system. The Japanese education system, as we know, it is one of the best education system in the world. So each year, the private and boarding school organization where we are working, more than 6,000 schools are here associated with the organization. And each year, more than 400,000 students, they are graduating and they are pursuing higher education in different parts of the world, even in Nepal, along of Nepal, in Australia, America, and even other parts also of the country. The panelist has discussed today that Nepal holds the third richest number of students in Japanese universities. But what we feel is that most of the students which they go in Japanese university, particularly they go for the vocational course, I think so. The higher studies, the higher university level education opportunity, which is available in Japanese universities, this is not well known to many of the students, I think so, because most of the students, what they feel is that the language is the basically main problem for them. The essentiality of Japanese language, and then they, if they could not get the language fluency, they will be unable. But today, what we found is that most of the Japanese universities, they have started giving the courses in English also. So it is a very good be benefit for most of the our students. Nextly, next thing is that the fee structure, which may be one problem for the Nepalese students, but 
the working environment working pattern or the uh, working uh, period time period which you will provide for the students it will work for that i hope so so that is the next thing the third one is the mostly the people of nepalese students or the nepali students where, who are going outside for the higher studies they are not well known about the system of japanese higher education we need more discussion more uh, such type of webinars so that the system can be open to all the students many of the people they know very well but among the students particularly when they complete high school level education in our country and they start going under graduate or graduate course in uh, the university level at that time we need the universities have to work more for them the panelist has given different important facts important attraction in japanese university the most important part of japanese education system what i feel is that their softness their uh, education which is based on particularly in the human kind the technological development devotion they have made in through the education in their progress so the cultural environment in nepal and the japan it is more or less same the benefits another benefits is that japan is very near to our nation our country even a 4 5 hours travel is enough to reach and travel there the working skills which we learn in japan particularly the hard working people what we learn is very important for us and that pattern of working in nepalese society also works very nice education uh, it is not based on the knowledge only the particular thing which we need to learn is that the turn to convert that knowledge into skills and for serve the human kind is the basic thing and that we can uh, take example from the japanese people in the world i think so because uh, they have made uh, their country or their people reach in the world with this uh, you know a, a type of uh, very softness and very servicing motive all the time that is the important thing the next thing whenever we talk about japan and japanese education system the techno friendly uh, people there the science which uh, has developed a lot that science is converted in technology in a such a beautiful way and that is used uh, utilized the technology has been utilized for the servicing of the people of the world is in a unique way so uh, when we talk about the higher education possibilities in japanese university uh, it is a unique place i think for the nepalese people nepalese students in the world it should be a unique place because as i know as i have understood every year from nepal a large number of students they are going about for the higher education and particularly when the children or the students they go for a higher education in other countries they will be looking for job opportunities particularly and i hope that can be managed in a well uh, manner in japanese universities if it can be done like that then i hope that it will be a uh, helpful and it will be very good for all of us so thank you once again the media uh, panel media helpline as well as jagdish ji and the other pan panelist a uh, different representative from the different universities for your kind uh, this invitation to private and boarding school organization and on behalf of the private and boarding school organization myself and my school i am very much thankful to you all to give me this opportunity to attend this wonderful uh, program today thank you we will be glad to work with you further in coming days thank you very much thank you so much um, uh, mr t adakal vice president private and boarding school organization of nepal papson for your wonderful valuable speech indeed um, and uh, thank you very much for your
strong uh, partnership uh, for this uh, uh, webinar and I think uh, it's being more fruitful, useful for the uh, Nepali student as well as the universities in uh, Japan also and we hope uh, in future there will be very good uh, relation between Babson and the university or um, educational institution in um, Japan also. Uh, so thank you very much once again for your wonderful speech. Um, uh, uh, dear friends, um, I, as I have already mentioned, the organizer of this uh, webinar is uh, Study in Japan Global Network Project, the University of uh, Tokyo, and uh, we have the partner Media Helpline as well as the uh, Papson. Now we are in, uh, we are in a second part. Um, the uh, QA session is uh, open now. I would like to request uh, Dr. Dipesh Karel um, uh, to read all the questions uh, with the participants' name that have been collected. Also, I would like to request all the concerned panelists and organizers to be prepared and provide the answer to all of the questions and queries. Thank you, Jagadish Ji. Uh, there are several questions. Uh, most of the questions, they are related to the scholarship. Uh, for example, uh, Anish, Anish Rijal, uh, she, uh, Anish Rijal mentioned she um, passed for plus two with a uh, 3.62 uh, GPA and now searching for the scholarship to study in Japan. And she is asking if there are other possibilities of a scholarship uh, beside the mixed. And what are the, the process for finding or searching the scholarship? Maybe this is this question can be to all the uh, panelists um, uh, university in Japan. And similarly, uh, there is a question from the Manika Bhandari. Uh, she has also, uh, her question is related to the um scholarship she uh, 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 she asked uh, uh, what are the selection criteria to secure the scholarship so so she uh, she she asked the the criteria uh, and what kinds of the uh, points given priority to be uh, selected as a scholarship student and uh, there is also uh, some um, queries asking uh, a possibility to uh, study uh, graduate school who already uh, finished the undergraduate program. Uh, someone also asking if uh, uh, Susmita Bora, for example, she is asking she is currently studying the bachelor's programs. Uh, if it's still possible to apply for the scholarship to study undergraduate program. Okay, thank you. So most of our uh, questions, they are related to the scholarship. Professor Jonathan, would you please uh, uh, tell us, is there any discrimination uh, regarding the nationalities in Japan um, while um, studying the higher education? in Tokyo, in University of Tokyo? Um, well, I mean, I, certainly not that I'm aware of. So it, it, certainly to the peak program that I talked to you about that we offer to international students is, is open to students from anywhere in the world. Um, and we are keen to encourage students from as many places as possible. And one of the real features of the program, as I as I explained, is that we have, it's a relatively small program and it's very international. So typically, uh, you know, among the 30 or so students every year, there may be 20 different nationalities or something like that. So much of the teaching is done in small groups and the students get to interact with each other and share their viewpoints and ideas. So it's a really fantastic opportunity to learn about people from different countries and cultures. So we're trying to build a you know, a very global campus and uh, make it a place that welcomes people from all over the world. So I, I think that would be my answer to your question. Would you please uh, add some about the scholarship um, uh, uh, relating with the University of Tokyo? So I think uh, the, there was a number of questions that we just heard about the scholarships. And I think, you know, listening to all the presentations, 
there are there are really two main options. You 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 can apply for the the MEXT scholarship directly through the embassy, or as you heard, each of the different institutions all have their own scholarship opportunities. So you need to consider both and look at the programs that you're interested in and see what the specific opportunities are that are available. So again, coming back to to the University of Tokyo particular case, as I showed you, we have. Two, two dedicated scholarship, two dedicated full scholarships that we offer, and there's no separate application for those, those scholarships. Um, uh, but also, um, the, and, and there is the, the application, there was a question before about what are the criteria for scholarships. So those scholarships are based on merit. And they're assessed along with your entry to the program. So we 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 do the the screening process for the program. We choose the very best students, and then we offer them the scholarships uh, as well. So there that that's the procedure for our our scholarships. I think every university has their own slight, slightly different procedures for how their scholarships operate. So what I think what it's worth doing as well is going and looking at all the different programs that you might be interested in. And you heard from a few universities today, but there. There are many more uh, of, uh, Japanese universities offering international programs, and and they do have scholarship opportunities available as well. Uh, within this time, I would like to ask uh, Hiroko is up here. Uh, so uh, may I ask, um, what is the difference between uh, um, uh, study in uh, Japan uh, compared uh, to developing country like Nepal? What is the difference that um, uh, the study environment? Uh, would you please uh, elaborate a little bit? Thank you so much. Yes, it's an interesting question. And then there, yes, actually, I was in Africa and Zambia. And then there, yeah, actually, there, yeah, it's uh, anywhere there. If you have uh, questions and then would like to the research and then the anywhere you can study. But actually, in Japan, and then the. Um, uh, I could say, uh, uh, yeah, I could say that yeah, the Japanese universities program are organized and then they're like um, really the designed, and then there's some universities, some countries universities are like um, students are really allowed to take their as much as different like a subject, but uh, it's like um, in Japanese, uh, uh, the university in Japan is uh, like a uh, prefixed, but it's really well designed. And then, the, and also there now the Japanese, good thing is Japanese government is really encouraging receiving the more international students. So that's why uh, the um, Japanese government has uh, also providing a lot of the general scholarships and also the many like uh, universities as well. So it's a really great opportunity to study in Japan and then also yeah of course yeah uh, student student have uh, asked another question to you just I'd like to uh, ask you again also especially the, um, their concern about the scholarship would you please tell um, about the scholarship in uh, uh, Rishu University that can be provided uh, um, uh, to Nepali student that Nepali student can search and seek for that yeah, thank you so much. Yes, as I explained to uh, it, within my uh, presentation, pre-enrollment, the scholarship we have also the tuition reduction scheme, 20% up to 100%, yes. And then on top of that, post-enrollment scholarships is also available. Once you enter the scholarship, I mean the yeah, university, and then twice a year, actually last year, APU also that that student also they explain the share the her experience with us and then yes twice a year there you can they apply to the scholarship and then there also the the office in church will match the yeah the merit base and also uh, the need base and then they match the scholarship the among student and also the sponsors yeah so those are the happening so the um, the and then they're also the uh, similar to the uh, university of tokyo no separate application is uh necessary for the uh tuition reduction scheme so simply they notify us you are uh, uh, intended to apply to the uh tuition reduction scheme and then the automatically you are the yeah the the list on that the Thank you so much. Once again, I would like to request uh, all the participants to um, uh, ask questions directly, visually. For that, you have to raise a hand symbol. Just very simple. Raise your 
hand symbol then ask the question you will get the audio access so once again i would like to request uh, you participant to ask the question this is one of the great opportunity that you can directly uh, communicate with all those presenters who are from the um, several university uh, representing the university uh, in japan can answer you directly so don't miss this opportunity i don't know what is happening there is uh, i think some technical error or some mistake i don't know why um, you are not appearing um, uh, visually so uh, i would like to uh, request you again to ask the question but uh, uh, meanwhile i would like to ask um, uh, request mr kyoshi takeda uh, would you please answer about the scholarship that the student has raised um, uh, through uh, inbox chat kyoshi takeda thank you uh, thank you very much for your um, for the participants questions about you know, regarding uh, scholarship and programs available at KUS which is our university uh, yes um like i i briefly touched upon on uh, scholarship scholarship programs available at KUS during my presentation um i also like to emphasize now that um, there is a, there is an, or there is a, there is a there is a variety of a strong scholarship programs available at KUS ranging from a 30% tuition reduction through a 50% tuition reduction even a 100% tuition reduction depending depending on the applicants or uh, academic credential 10 plus 2 exam results and also a leadership quality in simply put, we're gonna you know, take a holistic. Uh, what I mean, what I mean by that, so we're gonna take a comprehensive approach to make our decision on your scholarship levels. So um, I, I understand the uh, Nepalese students. The uh, uh, Nepalese tend to think that uh, yes, that we have. Uh, uh, 3.9, 3.9 GPA at, um, in, in, in 10 plus 2 exams. So we're gonna, we should be uh, qualified for this scholarship, that scholarship. Uh, that's, an, I guess, the, the ten, general tendency among the Nepalese students in the past regarding scholarship. But, but uh, in general, Japanese universities take holistic reviewing processes to make additions on the scholarship levels, like I said. Okay, thank you so much. The same question goes to uh, Mr. Victor uh, Sujat Miko. Uh, would you like to say something about this? Uh, okay, so I, as I previously mentioned, um, our current um, scholarship has been suspended um, due to COVID because we do not have capacity to um, um, uh, receive international students. But from um, 2023, um, September, uh, we'll be... Um, giving, um, again, um, providing the students uh, with um, scholarship um, for our Department of Information and Working for Innovation and Design. But we're still working on the details. So I'm, I'm really sorry, I, I cannot tell you about, um, you know, what the qualifications, but in general, it's just about the same. So like, you know, we're going to see, we're going to screen through um, the um, the students um, background, academic background, and then um, invisibility. And then um, we're going to conduct interview as well. As well. And then, um, yeah, like, you know, those kind of um, elements, we're just going to combine together. And then if you are qualified, then um, you'll be able to come to a university with the scholarship. Uh, but again, like, you know, um, it's not um, fixed yet. We're still working on it. Um, but again, like, you know, we, we just want to um, let you know that until um, university um, accepts international students. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Pavan, would you like to say the in short about the process to get a scholarship uh, for Nepali people? In short. Uh, yes, uh, actually they have already mentioned, but uh, what I feel is the selection criteria based upon three major factors, what I understood during the Japanese uh, selection process. Number one is the course grade and merit is the number one criteria. And the second criteria is the SOP, statement of purpose written by the student about their research field is the second most criteria. And the third one is about the recommendation letters from the professors and the persons who recommend. So these three things, I think, governs most of the criteria of the scholarship and is very competitive. Thank you. 
uh, Rashi, Amazon, uh, the same, uh, the same issue, the same topic about this culture. Would you like to say something? Yes, yes. Why not? I think. Rightly so, it is the most popular question, and I feel that it's really important to know. <laughs> <laughs> I would also be interested in scholarship. I want to add uh, on to what Dr. Bowen said about the three criteria, and I would also like to add uh, interview also being one of the most important ones. Um, as um, Hirano san has already talked about pre enrollment and post enrollment, um, what you can do right now is the pre enrollment scholarship. So, um, based on what your application is and based on what your interview goes like, it depends on how much scholarship percentage you're getting. So I would really um, encourage the students, um, aspirant students to really take time and polish their application. Um, sometimes what happens is that even if your um, academics is not as strong, what you have as a personality or what you have as a quality or a talent, that might stand out. So make sure that you know who you are and make sure that you are honest in presenting who you are. Because at the end of the day, this university wants to know you and you only want to go to a university that knows you and is able to provide scholarship for you, understanding um, the kind of student you are. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Rashi Martin. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, all the presenter panelists, once again, for your wonderful uh, presentation as well. Under wonderful reply uh, answer. And it's really, uh, indeed, it's really um, great opportunity for all the students, Nepali students um, all over the Nepal. Uh, so now we are uh, at the end of the program. Um, uh, as I have already mentioned you that uh, we have the uh, partners, uh, Papson and Media Helpline, and the organizer is a study in Japan Global Network Project, the University of Tokyo. Uh, so uh, now I would like to request uh, Mr. Kazuhiro Muri, Advisor, International Strategy Group Management Planning Department, the University of Tokyo. Since two hours, you have been. Um, sincerely watching, uh, hearing and pursuing uh, the topic issue that we are discussing. Um, uh, now, I would like to request you uh, for the closing remarks and uh, vote, of the, uh, vote of thanks. Um, uh, Mr. Koju Hiromori. Uh, respected Mr. Uh, uh, Tukaran Dakar, uh, Vice President of Papson, uh, distinguished guest speakers and participants. Namaste, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mori, uh, advisor for International Strategy Group of the University of Tokyo. The University of Tokyo, having been appointed for the study in Japan Global Network Project by Japanese government mixed, acts as a gateway for prospective students in Southwest Asia. We have project offices in, in India, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh while the University of Tokyo has been doing the same in Nepal without having physical points of contact. This has been made possible as a result of the kind and passionate support from the Juan members and the current and former Nepali students in Japan. Thank you very much for organizing this seminar and we do hope that this event has been informative for you to consider Japan as one of your choices to study for higher education. As many speakers mentioned, we believe Japan is one of the best destination of higher education for Nepali students in developing your academic and professional careers. Please do not hesitate to contact the universities that presented today for further inquiries. We do look forward to seeing you in Japan with hope that the COVID-19 situation improves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Mori, uh, for the closing remarks as well as uh, vote of thanks. Definitely, Japan is an important destination for higher education. As a result, nowadays, a huge quantity of Nepalese students are going to Japan to study. We hope that this conference has helped all students to be clear on various questions like, why do we have to go to Japan for higher education? 
What kind of higher education opportunities are available in Japan? What kind of procedures do we have to follow to go to Japan for higher education? How is your future uh, secure after higher education in Japan? We also expect that this program will help to increase partnership, cooperation, goodwill and coordination between Nepal's and Japan's educational institutions in future. Finally, we are very much thankful to watch our keynote speaker, Mr. T.R. Dhakal, all respected panelists, students and all the participants. Your time and presence was very precious for us. To make today's event a grand success, all the colleagues have played an important part in today's webinars. Your efforts, time and presence has made this webinar more successful. So thank you very much and congratulations to all the colleagues for this success. Once again, we are very grateful to us study in Japan Global Network Project, University of Tokyo for organizing this important program and we are very much grateful towards Papson and Media Helpline for this strong partnership and thank you very much once again um, to all uh, for your patience for these two hours so thank you all um, take care, stay safe, Shayanara. Arigato gozaimasu.